Brian, good to have you back. Thanks for uh, thanks for rejoining me. I, you know, I couldn't agree any more with you on the subjects of culture and core values. So I really appreciate your perspective there. And you know, I think we could do a whole nother conversation on that topic because it's one that's uh, near and dear to my heart. So appreciate that a lot. And I can see that's why uh, you guys have built such a great environment over at over at Embrace. So thank you. Well, thanks um, for indulging me on it. I, I could go on forever about it too. So thanks, Ron. No, I appreciate that. Um, so can we talk about talent a little bit? You know, one of my one of my kind of you know constituents I like to focus on is is you know entry level you know people that's still in college thinking about um, you know their move out into the workforce. You know, as a as a person who's you know obviously you know been through the the evolution you've been through and and who probably you know hires lots of people. Can you talk to me about um, or you know talk to my audience about what you would suggest to them? on how to best prepare themselves uh, coming out of college. And that includes not only how to, how to go through an interview process or how to approach companies to get interviews, but even what are you seeing as, as kind of the, the, the best areas to focus in from a, a career perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there's a lot of people graduating from school who struggle with this. I like to boil it down to really the simplicity of this is that your value is derived from two main things. It's your network, and your experience, right? And both of those are very small. They're lacking when you get out of college, right? Maybe some of us are lucky. Maybe you have a good network through your parents or through other things. But most of us when we're graduating don't have a huge network and we clearly don't have any experience. And I think the first step is just knowing that and accepting that. I think kids struggle with that. You know, they, they get yep. out of school and they're like, why can't I get this job with this title or this thing? And and often their answer is, I'm going to go back to school. Like that, that is almost always the wrong answer, unless you're trying to be a doctor or a lawyer or something that actually requires that further education. And I think it's a big reason that we have a lot of the student debt that we have today. And we have a lot of people who feel really unsatisfied uh, with their experience so far. But if they really take and think, okay, my value is in my network and in my skill set, then you should look to grow both of those, mm -hmm. right? So, yep. so step one is, when you're getting out of out of job, it's it's out of college. The, your first job is less about like how attractive that role is or what the title is that comes with it. It has everything to do with who you'll be working for, right? And and with whom you'll be working. So the most important thing in career satisfaction and in your growth as a person is your direct leader, your direct boss, right? So shop for that first. Don't shop for that first job, shop for that first boss, that person who is going to be your sponsor, um, who's going to take you under their wing, who's going to help to mentor you, who is going to take an interest in you both personally and professionally, right? Someone who wants to see you grow and excel um, and, and eventually grow into who you want to be. Um, and I think that is the most important thing that people should be shopping for. And, and honestly, Ron, not just in your first job out of school, I just think always, you know, yeah, if, you're, if yeah. you're looking for a career, the, the number one thing that drives satisfaction and whether or not people stay or leave at a, at a job is their immediate leader. Um, and so I think that's what people need to be thinking about when they get out of school is that what is my best opportunity to grow my network and to grow my experience? And your immediate leader has everything to do with those things. Gotcha. You know, one of the things you said earlier, um, this is going to be more of a statement than a question, but that I've found recently, even though I've been doing this for 25 years, but I found recently that hits home the most is the concept of being curious. You know, you mentioned being reliable. You mentioned, um, you know, obviously following through and, and delivering on the on the work that you know, you know you've been given, but. The being curious thing has just been, you know, kind of one of those things I keep coming back to a lot and more lately as I'm working with, um, you know, especially younger talent on, on making that transition. Um, you know, any, any, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, but do you have any, any tips or suggestions around, you know, how to, how to build that capability or characteristic, or do you think it's just one of those things you have or don't have? You know, I, I think the answer, I could talk out of both sides of my mouth on this one. I think that there are some things that we have a natural proclivity to, right? The nature versus nurture kind of argument. And I think there are things that we can work on it and get better at, you know? So I think one, it's just about setting an intention. So first of all, you bring up 
the phenomenal point. I, I think another way to phrase it is, is like interesting versus interested. Mm. I think people think that, you know, mm. to be valuable, they have to be interesting. Um, but the truth is, it's the exact opposite. You have to be interested. And, and that means just being, to your point, genuinely curious and inquisitive about how things work or who people are. Um, and I think that, that we know that to be one of the number one skills in success for people. Have you watched Ted Lasso? Oh, I love that show. We're watching it. Yeah, can't miss an episode. Okay, so have you seen all of season one already? Or you're oh, yeah. so you're yep. on, okay. Season two. So when he is in the bar and playing darts, he talks about curiosity, yes. right? And he talks about it being such a strength, and that it it really is to the detriment of somebody who is not curious because they're going to miss everything. You know, you're going to miss you know the opportunities. You're going to miss the opportunity to help other people grow. You're going to miss where your competitors. Are, are leaving the door open for you to come in. Like you're just not going to be asking the questions that are going to lead to the things that you want. I love that scene. I yeah, thought it was so right. good. By the way, I love everything about that show. And similarly, lately I've been thinking, what would Ted Lasso do? Yeah, yeah, right? lots because, of people are, yeah. Yeah, he's just such a genuinely good character. He's a good leader. He's a curious human being. He's very externally focused on other people. He's internally motivated. And, and I think those are just two key traits in, in leaders and in people who succeed is that are you internally motivated, meaning that you have your own motivation, your own code, your own, your own core values that drive you on a day-to-day -day basis, basis, your own ethos, right? Um, you know, as opposed to relying upon external incentive, incentives or rewards or these kinds of things. And then where's your focus? Is it on you, right? Like, so back to being curious or interesting versus interested. Is it about like what I'm getting and what's good for me, or is it about what I can be doing for others? You know, for all the the stakeholders in your life, your family, your team members, your customers, your ownership, right? The community that you live in, all of these things. And I just think like, yeah, you know, Ted Lasso, he's the man. I like that. Yeah, that was a that was pretty uh, pretty awesome to pull that one out of uh, that whole season. That's a really good. It's a really good. Uh way to put some put some a box around what we just talked about so thank you for that i'm gonna go yeah, back and sure. watch that scene again for sure um so last part uh as it relates to you know kind of the other end of the spectrum you know for those that are you know have been out in the workforce and and are thinking about making a move um what have you seen from a hiring manager that you appreciate the most from from how people put their you know, either profiles together or, or, you know, uh, interview the best, you know, what have you seen that you like and is attractive to you? Yeah, I, you know, from a profile perspective, or a CV or a resume, I, I've never been big into it, because I just think they might show one skill, which is your ability to self promote or to, you know, maybe they show how concise you can write or, you know, these kinds of things, how, you know, they might show your grammar and your syntax, but there's plenty of people with poor syntax and or grammar in some cases that are very successful in a lot of different things. Um, so I've always, you know, you've got to have some level of experience, obviously, if you're talking to me, you know, but um, at some point, it's really about like, how do you engage? How do you interact? And, you know, how do you drive an interview process? So uh, my thing is like, I, I like people who actually take control of the interview process and own it and drive it. Um, I liken it to a good sales process, you know, and I, you know, it's funny because I think everybody to some extent should be well-versed in sales. I mean, it's just really the ability to understand somebody else, what they need, what's important to them, and then deliver that to them. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of ways to do that, but you've got to run a good sales process. To your point, you've got to be curious. You've got to ask the right questions. You need to control the conversation. The best way to do that is by asking questions. And so I love when people come in and they really lay it out there like this is either going to the, the only way that this is going to work is if it's a win win right if i like you and you like me and we both feel confident that i'm the right fit for this and it's the right opportunity mutually then i'm interested in talking more to you so when people come in and in general ron i think i just like that when people engage me at an equal level i yeah. i don't like when someone comes in and gives me too much deference that feels uncomfortable to me and i don't like it and I also don't like the opposite of when someone comes in and they take themselves so seriously. It's like, let's just get together and have a conversation, right? And get yep. to figure out whether this is a good fit or a not fit, a good fit. So, you know, going back to, I like when someone comes in and they say that, they state it like a foreshadow and a sales process. 
like, hey, Ron, you know, I'm excited to sit down with you here today. Like, I uh, heard a lot of great things. You know, I'm interested in asking you some questions, learning more about the opportunity and seeing if there might be a fit between the two of us. I want someone to say that to me. I yeah. like when they say that. And then I want them to pivot right away to a question. Hey, what, you know, what, what's gone well so far that I'm sitting in front of you right now? Like, how, how did we get to the point where, we're, where I'm talking to you now? Back right? to like, being curious, them. right? Back to yeah, being interested. Like, yep. For sure. Tell me what the day to day is. What it's, what's it like to work with you? And, and not on your good day. What's it like to work with you on your bad day? Right. Like I want people actually weighing and qualifying and doing discovery around the opportunity, not because they're trying to impress me, because they're really seeking to see, is it the right opportunity for them? I think that's what candidates miss. And sometimes that's what just poor salespeople miss yep. is that they're so excited and or desperate to get a yes that they're failing to qualify whether they even want that opportunity or whether it's even the right one for them. So I guess the, the long and short of your question is, I think what I like to see out of candidates in the process is that they're doing really good discovery and qualification to what the mutual fit is or isn't. Gotcha. Okay. Very helpful. One more for you, then I'll promise I'll let you go. Tell me about the insurance space. Like, why are there so many new niche companies that are making so much money and going public? Is it, is it, is it the application of technology and marketing that's creating all these new businesses? Are there really, are there new businesses really, or am I just never paid attention before? And these have always been there. And what's, it just seems like everywhere you turn, there's an insurance company for this or for that. And they're all over the place. Yeah, I mean, listen, we we're in the next revolution. Yeah, I think it'd be like the second industrial revolution is where we're at right now. You had an agricultural revolution, you had an industrial revolution, and now we're in the second industrial revolution. You might call it a knowledge or a digital, you know, kind of place that we're at right now in terms of a revolution. And, and that's been taking place over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. right, with the internet and mm -hmm. the growth of digital technologies. And to a large extent, insurance is still ripe for disruption there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think any time that you've got really entrenched incumbents who are really big, who are really good at a lot of things, right? They're really good at the insurance business. They understand the pricing, the modeling. They might understand great claims. Um, there's a lot that they do well. They wouldn't be entrenched if they didn't do it well. But they're so big that they're not nimble in a lot of cases. And so there are a lot of things in the insurance industry that I think just are at this point, 20 years into re this revolution are still taken for granted. So I, I was on a call the other day and we were speaking to one of the largest uh, auto insurance carriers and one of their marketing people asked a question about um, the mobile optimization of our website. And you know, it was, it was a really basic question. It was really simply, is your site mobily optimized, right? And the, the funny thing is our VP of marketing, he, he went to like a next level answer, but didn't necessarily just say, yes, our website is mobily optimized. And I think it's because he's newer to the insurance world and didn't realize that like, hey, like anywhere else, that's the ante to play, right? That you have a mobily optimized website or even a mobile first website. And so that question from a large insurance carrier isn't as complex as you might think, and they aren't setting you up. They're really just simply asking like, hey, are you guys cool enough that you have your site to be yeah. mobily optimized? Yeah. Um, and so I think that's why you see what you're seeing, Ron, is that you know, this revolution, one, some of it's just you know, low-hanging fruit um, and just moving to more modular technology, using more API-first approaches, um, consolidating da data in one single place, um, being able to take, um, you know, unstructured data and understand it better. All these things that large insurance incumbents just aren't good at and or just have such legacy technology that to move to that is, is a large task for them. So if you and I were starting a brand new insurance company, um, we are actually in a better position than a lot of these guys who have been around for a hundred years or 75 years, whatever it might be, because we don't have the legacy technology to worry about. Gotcha. We would start API first. We would start in a modular infrastructure. Um, we would be able to use, you know, top not top notch data services. So we could append data quickly. We could build models to make decisions. And that's what you're seeing from these insurers, right? So, you know, whether it be, 
uh, a hippo or a lemonade or whoever it might be, they are using the most sophisticated but simple API-first modular technologies. They're tapping into the mountains of data that exist everywhere. So I think, you know, Hippo is a great example of someone who does this is that you go in and they're probably spending a couple bucks on every quote that they do, just pulling in data services so that from the consumer perspective, the quote process is so easy. You know, you can quote your home in, in a couple of minutes compared to what a, another entrenched carrier might want or need from you, um, just because of how manual their process might be and how old their technology is. And you're also seeing that on the claim side and the underwriting side of the house, right? So, um, you know, when you have uh, this, this more slick and modular infrastructure, um, it's easier again to pull data in, make underwriting decisions on that data in real time in terms of, you know, one, just at the top of the funnel, do you even want to quote this risk or do you want to send them to a competitor? Or when you quote this risk to get real time and get the right rate in because you're pulling enough data points. So I think really it just comes down to the, um, the Achilles heel of these entrenched folks mm -hmm. is that they have all this legacy technology um, on which they're dependent. It's expensive. It's time consuming and it's just difficult to migrate over to new technology and there's a lot of inherent risk in it your whole business is tied up in your tech stack right sure, sure whereas if you start from scratch you build the tech stack right you build it very inexpensively in most cases yep. and that's a huge advantage um, to entry into the market to allow these folks gotcha. and then the last thing is this i know i'm going on no. this is the last thing the, listen everyone's laid in cash right now right? They're just like, yeah. where can I put my money in the next big thing? And so, yeah, you see a lot of these guys going public, some of them with value, valuations that are relevant, reasonable, and rightfully so, but some of them with valuations that are just BS, right? They're yeah. just because the market is where it is right now. The underlying economics aren't there, though. And, and so you and I have a mutual friend. I believe you're friends with Christian uh, Giardini as well. And, and he would always say, Listen, it's still always going to be about underlying economics. You know, at the end of the day, the long-term investment is still about running a profitable, disciplined company. Yep. And, and a lot of these guys are not able to do that. So, yep. um, you know, it's kind of uh, all show, no go in some of the cases. But you will see, you know, you'll see more consolidation because they do have things that are valuable and resources that others would like to have. So that's my long answer to your question. Gotcha. And it's definitely all show, all go over at Embrace Pet Insurance, from what I understand, right? Well, you know, we, we don't do everything right, but we try to do most of it. <laughs> you know, I think interestingly enough, Ron, we, we're, we are a more entrenched pet insurer, even as nascent as the industry is, we've been around for 15 years. Yep. And so we yep. do have legacy technology yep. and, you know, a big piece of, of our focus in the last two years has been migrating to a, a more ostensible uh, infrastructure and moving our tech stack to API first modular based technologies, you know, micro um, products on the front end with our UX and UI. And so, and there is more risk for us because we're having to move our entire business over to these things. Whereas someone brand new, you know, could be a FIGO or a Lemonade or whoever else, they just come in with the right stuff out of the gate. And, and to some extent, like, you know, God bless them. That's a lot easier. There's no doubt about it. Um, and what we're doing is, is maybe a little bit harder. Yep. It's a lot to unpack. Brian, I really appreciate your time today. <laughs> I, uh, and I can't wait to share this and, and thanks a lot. Yeah, Rob, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.